And the clergy here in the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, referred to the pastor as the pastor, kind of the way St. Thomas <laughs> referred to uh, Aristotle as the philosopher. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Priest for an Apostolic Age podcast. I'm your host, Peter Androsic, Senior Consultant with the Evangelical Catholic. And I'm your co-host, Father Keith O'Hare from the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia. Today's episode, we're going to talk about the theology of renewal in the church, and we have a special guest, Professor Douglas Bushman. Well, good morning. I'm happy to be here. Well, happy to have you. So I'm I'm real excited for this conversation. Um it's a it's a it's a topic that I hold dear in in my heart. And um, but before we do that, let's let's pray. So Peter and Professor Bushman, for our prayer, I'm going to take a, a, a passage from Ecclesiam Suam, which we're going to get all into today in this discussion, paragraph number fifty-eight. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If the Church acquires an ever-growing awareness of herself. And if the church tries to model itself on the ideal which Christ proposes to it, the result is that the church becomes radically different from the human environment in which it, of course, lives or which it approaches. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world. You call us also to be the light of the world as the church of Christ. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit to this conversation today. Show us how it is that the church is renewed by the Holy Spirit. Pope St. Paul VI, pray for us. Pray for in us. the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I am excited and nervous for today's conversation because um, Douglas was a professor of mine. Back in 2005 to 2008, I did a master's program through Ave Maria University, the Institute for Pastoral Theology. Uh, Douglas, at the time, I think you were the director of the program, weren't you? That's right. Yeah. And um, so that was three years of, of grad school and some of the fondest memories and some of the most, um, probably the most formative period um, for me, at least theologically, um, in my adult life. And I would say this, um, I would say that Douglas, your classes and, and your thought has probably had the greatest, most formative impact on the way that I think theologically and pastorally. Um, so anything that's positive that comes out of my mouth or uh, out of the pen, so to speak, um, has been shaped by you. Uh, the other stuff that's in error has not come uh, from <laughs> from from your uh, ap apprenticing. Um, so I'm I'm super excited to have you on the show, Douglas. Um, so before we we're, we're, today, we're going to talk about the theology of renewal in His Church. We're going to talk about a book that you just wrote. Um, but before we do that, can you just can you just tell us a little bit about um, you know where you're coming from? Walk us through your formation and your experience a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, the most significant uh, thing for our purposes is uh, I was blessed to spend six years studying under the Dominican Pontifical Faculty at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. And, uh, and germane to our conversation, for, for the faculty there, Vatican II was simply the 22nd ecumenical council in the church's history that is meant to be integrated into the entire tradition. And so I had this magnificent theological formation Thomistically based, but with regard to Vatican II, the professors, they were just so serenely integrating it into the courses which they had really uh, created prior to the council. And so I left the University of Freiburg thinking, well, that's how everybody looked at Vatican II. <laughs> and uh, coming back to the United States, I found out that that was not the case. Uh, mm -hmm. More about that later. So uh, following that, I came back to the United States and I worked for four years in a parish. This was my, uh, uh, and then six years in a diocese. So here in Minneapolis is the parish and the diocese of Duluth in Northern Minnesota. And so uh, it, the audience should know, I spent four years living in the rectory. Uh, this is obviously before I was married. And I saw the, I saw a model parish uh, from the inside out. Uh, I lived uh, 
two of the associates that were there at the time are now bishops. Oh my uh, goodness. Wow. Yeah. And and the clergy here in the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis referred to the pastor as the pastor, kind of the way St. Thomas <laughs> would refer to uh, Aristotle as the philosopher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so it was it was really magnificent. Um so there's there's where I let's call that my pastoral experience. Sure. And, and then a position became open at the University of Dallas for the Institute for Religious and Pastoral Studies. And it, in, it, it basically was a bridge between the world of academe and, uh, and the pastoral life of the church. And so my background was perfectly suited to that. Uh, nine years at the University of Dallas and then 12 at Ave Maria. Basically, it's the same program. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I had eight wonderful years at the Augustan Institute uh, on a research grant um, and uh, the book that we're going to be talking about was really, is the first fruit of uh, all of that work. And now I'm semi-retired, uh, came back to Minnesota to work at a parish, um, only to uh, have long COVID for about a year, which was God's way of saying, slow down and write more, I hope. Sure, sure. You know, I, I didn't know, well, maybe somewhere in my, in my, um, you know, long-term memory. Um, I didn't know that you lived in a rectory. Um, it, interesting. So when I was uh, studying under you at the IPT, I was also living in a rectory. So I, I lived, so we did that in Green Bay. Um, and at the time I lived in, in a, a little town in like North Central Wisconsin. I was working for f uh, three and then four parishes um, at the same time. There's one priest, Father John Girardi. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you remember him. Uh, and he was a pastor and I was the only full-time employee. And so I, I was living in, in one of the rectories with my wife and that's where we started our family. So, um, it was, it was a pastoral immersion while I was studying and it was just such a wonderful experience. Um, so the, you know, that being said, let's, let's dive into the, into the, into the conversation. So Douglas, you just published this, this year a book called The Theology of Renewal for His Church. Um, could you just tell us what prompted you to write this book? Yes, well, um, uh, the parish that I first worked for after graduate school, the pastor um, that I referred to um, was quite a, a fan of Paul VI encyclical, Ecclesiam Suum is the um, Latin name, and that's where the it means his church. So the title of the book, a theology, the theology of renewal for his church, is a not so subtle reference to obviously the encyclical. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was my first exposure, and he he derived all kinds of pastoral principles and guidance from this encyclical. Um, then, uh, when I, uh, moved to the Diocese of Duluth, I took that with me and it proved to be very effective in understanding how to, uh, prioritize and, uh, and to envision, uh, all the things that are going on in the life of the church. I always call the, the, the parish, the retail dimension of the church's life. <laughs> That's where things are happening. Okay. For the vast majority of the lay faithful. And, um, and so it became part of my uh, courses that I would teach over the 21 year period, directing the master's program at the University of Dallas and Ave Maria University. And students would uh, often say, why, why am I hearing this for the first time? We should know about this because they perceived that it was spiritually deep and enriching, doctrinally rock solid, um, and that it had implications for the pastoral life of the church. Now, it helps to have someone that had learned that from a, from a, a master pastor. Um, uh, and so there was a lot of encouragement on the part of the students over the years. But really, the, I resolved to write the book in 2012-2013. Uh, this was the year of faith mm -hmm. called by Benedict the Sixteenth, and it began on October 11th, uh, 2012, the 50th anniversary of the opening of Vatican II. 
So Benedict was sending a really strong signal uh, about the importance of Vatican II in his pontificate and obviously in the pontificate of his predecessor, John Paul uh, II. And so I was privileged to uh, be asked to give presentations on Vatican II. I think it was in about six dioceses. And this was for the bishops uh, and their clergy, uh, priests and deacons. Some of them had um, some lay leadership there, but most of all, it was the clergy. And so I uh, tried to give them an overall sense of the renewal of Vatican II. And this was the eye-opening one. They would say what my former students had said. Why are we hearing this for the first time? <laughs> um, and, and I began to ask questions like, well, how many of you had a course on Vatican II? And, uh, well, what counts as a course? We had the document on the liturgy for our liturgy course. We had the document on the church for the church uh, ecclesiology course. No, how many of you had a course on Vatican II? No one. And so they never had an opportunity to step back and see Vatican II in its totality. And, uh, and there, therefore, uh, many of them, uh, the younger ones at that time, were John Paul II uh, vocations. And, uh, and now they are, are starting to see that the man who had so inspired them, uh, what was inspiring him, the Second mm -hmm. Vatican Council. So that's when I said, this is too important. I've got to get the message out. So in, in the book, if, if I'm correct in understanding this, the, the thesis is that Ecclesium Suam, this kind of, it's almost an obscure encyclical. No one ever really hears about this encyclical, um, unless they've taken a course from you. <laughs> um, this, this encyclical, Ecclesium Suam, is kind of like a, the hermeneutic for really understanding Vatican II and, 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 the, and the implementation. Am I correct in, in saying that? Yes, that's the thesis of the book. Okay. So uh, even to the could, point where I don't say it's a theology of renewal, I say it's the theology of renewal. Already I'm making a very uh, important theological statement there. Okay. So this podcast is Priest for an Apostolic Age, right? And so the, the, the um, understanding um, or, or the assumption is that we're entering into kind of a post-Christian age right now. As Pope Francis says, this is not a um, uh, an epoch of change. It's a change of epoch or, or era. I'm not sure the, the word he, he used there. But here we have um, Vatican II, which really foresaw all of this. Um, and people trying to implement, and it's, 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 it's not working the way that people are trying to implement it. But this, but the, one of the reasons is, they missed out the the encyclical. Could could you just talk us through, um, you know, in broad strokes, what is the hermeneutic here? What, how is it that this encyclical is the hermeneutical key for understanding and implementing Vatican II? Well, so you're asking me to condense a a, a 400 page book here. I and am. I am. <laughs> The um, so the encyclical has three parts to it, and uh, understanding the way that these three parts relate is is the key. Okay. Uh, let me just first of all say uh, we are definitely uh, not entering into, but I think it's really safe to say we're in a post-Christian culture, yeah. uh, which doesn't mean that there aren't vestiges of the prior Christian culture. For heaven's sake, uh, the parish there are many parishes that have. A very strong Catholic culture still, but I think it's safe to say that there are fewer and fewer of them. Um, the, the culture no longer supports the faith, but is an attack on the faith. All right. So the point I want to make here is um, that uh, that Vatican II is really the first post Christendom Council of the Church. Oh, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's that says an awful lot. In fact, that important book uh, from Monsignor Shea, From Christendom to Apostolic Mission, uh, would serve as a great introduction to a course on Vatican II. Uh, you would have read it if it had been available at the time that you took ecclesiology from me. Okay. Cool. okay. Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, I'm a little surprised that the author didn't uh, come right out and say that. 
uh, but so be it. So, um, so uh, John the Twenty Third was a historian. Uh, he had uh, spent a good portion of his uh, younger life um, basically compiling documents on Saint Charles Borromeo, who was one one of the great figures at the Council of Trent and one of the great reformers who implemented the council in his diocese. And so there's an awful lot of history and an understanding of what real reform is in John the 23rd's decision to call the council. We can go on and on about that. The point I wanna make here is simply that Paul the sixth was profoundly faithful to and in continuity with his predecessor, John the 23rd. And this is evident in Ecclesiom Suam, the encyclical that we're talking about. And by the way, uh, this is an interesting uh, thing. The the, uh, the encyclical, most of its editions, it's entitled "The Paths of the Church." Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? So there are three paths the church must trod uh, during okay. this time of renewal. Okay. Well, that always threw me because usually uh, encyclicals take their title from their first couple or three Latin words. Mm-hmm. Well, the first words of this encyclical are "Ecclesiam Suam." his church. So you say, wait a minute, where did paths of the church come from? And I lived with that question for several years, finally read Paul the sixth um, general audience, which came the day before the encyclical was promulgated. And he said, this encyclical could be entitled paths of the church. Mm-hmm. Well, how refreshing is it that it, that a translator was following the Holy Father and took his lead, and, and that, <laughs> that made its way into the very uh, the very title of, of the encyclical? All right. So he envisioned three paths: mm-hmm. uh, awareness or consciousness mm-hmm. is the first path; renewal is the second path; and then dialogue is the third path. So the best, I think the best way to put this forward is to start at the third path and work your way back. There, there's where we see the logic. All right. So the logic of renewal is John the 23rd saw that culture was becoming increasingly secularized and the Christian dimension of culture was on the wane very profoundly. Uh, Now he saw this already in the 1950s. And can I make just a point about, I think this is an important point. There are many people who their narrative, their reading of history is that uh, the church was humming along on all cylinders uh, until Vatican II came along and that disrupted everything. So can't we pretend like Vatican II never happened and uh, and get on with being church? Mm-hmm. Well, Joseph Ratzinger is a young, uh, newly minted professor uh, did a radio spot. I suppose they might even call it a podcast like this, although that's not what they didn't have it back in those days. In 1957, I believe, uh, this pod, this radio uh, interview was entitled The New Paganism in the Church. You know, I recently just read that. I, um, it's really interesting. I, I don't think... I don't, within the last couple of months, I don't think I ever heard about that. That's where he first said something about um, uh, the, the church is going to decrease or, 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 or before it increases. I've heard that statement a lot, um, but I, I never heard of the source until just a couple of months ago. And I just recently read that. That's very interesting. Go go on. Well, and I'll just add one more. Cardinal Suhard, of, uh, who was the uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Paris, had written a pastoral letter in 1940, 10 years earlier, 43, 47, somewhere in the middle 40s, calling calling France missionary territory. Hmm. He, sure. So he was really the first one to, um, this is a full-blown treatise uh, by uh, Cardinal Suhart. The point, the simple point I want to make is John the 23rd, uh, there were other great uh, pastors of, of, of surrounding him that were reading the signs of the times and saw the extraordinarily worrisome indications of the waning of authentic Christian faith. We still had a sacramental life. The churches, uh, uh, there were still funerals and marriages, you know, that's the way things are today. 
they saw this uh, a good 10 years before Vatican II. And that says something about Professor Bushman. Yes. So a, a question comes to my mind that I've never thought of till this conversation today, and that is because you're 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 talking about how John the Twenty Third uh, had a sense of history and the discernment of calling a council. What would have happened? I know this is just a brief tangent here, but what would have happened if there had been no calling of a council? Because you're describing how the church was struggling paganism in the church that 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 reference just now what what would the church have experienced absent a council that was trying to address the modern situation well i so that's a great question and we can you know we can only kind of uh, imagine uh but uh john the 23rd said that inspiration for calling the council came to him from the holy spirit and I think that the Holy Spirit was also whispering to Cardinal Suhard and Joseph Ratzinger and a lot of German bishops and a lot of French bishops and a lot of uh, Italian and uh, Belgian theologians and French theologians. The whole resourcement movement in theology of the 20th century is already a response to the decline of Christian culture and an effort to recover to understand the tradition so deeply that we can make it come alive anew in these new historical circumstances. And so, so my answer is the Holy Spirit's not going to abandon the church. If the Pope hadn't done that, there would have been bishops, archbishops, and cardinals, and theologians, and new religious orders uh, aplenty in order to guide the church into uh, a, a renewal. And so, uh, and, but I, my contention is that was already happening in the 20th century. So Vatican II, uh, it, it wasn't a top-down uh, kind of uh, way to understand things. The Holy Spirit had prepared the council for a good 50, 60, actually from Vatican I forward, almost 100 years. And what Vatican II basically did was discern what is of the Holy Spirit in the theological, religious, and above all, these amazing movements in the lay apostolate that took place in the 20th century. You know, I, I just have yeah, to comment on this. So, yeah. so it's, it's interesting. Um, so the, 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 the Cardinals and the Pope is looking at the church and saying, something's up here. Something's wrong. We need to, we need renewal. The church is not, is, is not effective in the world anymore. It's not as effective. We're, we're not reaching people like, like, um, we're called to, and it, it's really interesting because, you know, I, I, I'm, I work with parishes and, and dioceses all over the place. And, and oftentimes the impression is just the opposite. The impression is that, oh, back in the, you know, thirties, forties, and fifties, it was almost kind of like the golden age of American Catholicism. Vocations were, were up, parishes were full, parish life was, was, um, um, was abundant, um, but the 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 popes and or the pope and the the bishops were seeing something else, and I find that really interesting. It an, analogously, it's it's like the father of a family who has grace of state is sensing that something's up with his family. Everyone else is humming along, and maybe maybe everyone's like. I don't know, maybe everyone's really busy with sports and this and that and all these other things. These are all good things, right? Um, but but somehow the father is, of the family is, is catching wind of like, ah, when's the last time we ate together as a family? When's the last time we prayed the rosary together as a family? When's, and and if, if the father doesn't say anything about that, eventually what's going to happen is, is, is everyone just kind of starts going their own way and there's a, there's a gradual dissolving of family relations. I see something kind of analogous here um, where we look back at the thirties, forties and fifties and we think, Oh my goodness, if only, if only we could recreate that or recapture that. But the reality is there were ma major breaches in the hull, so to speak uh, in the early and mid 1900s uh, such that pastoral letters and addresses were being given, Pope calls a council. Um, I just find that really interesting. I, I, never, I, I never put that together 
in that quite in that way until this this moment. Well, let um, me say, uh, and Professor, uh, wouldn't you also speak about the role of philosophy with regard to theology? Because is is not struggles in theology to say that preceded by struggles in philosophy, or, or to put it simply, bad philosophy makes for bad theology. So, is there a philosophical? Is there evidence of philosophy also going astray long before the '60s? To say it that way. Oh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, here, um, we could put it this way, was was the, um, let's call it dialogue with Enlightenment philosophy always done well? <laughs> and I think the answer is no. Uh, so there was, there were, uh, there were, uh, first of all, the influence of these philosophies in the general culture is hard to measure. Um, and especially in Europe. Um, I was going to say uh, to Peter that uh, I think the United States was lagging behind. I think you know, Europe was um, far ahead of the United States in terms of the secularization of the church okay. and the real crisis of faith. And so in the 30s, 40s, uh, uh, I don't think we had the same worrisome signs here in the United States. All right. I'll defer to historians on that. The father's point is is really really important. Uh, it, it the the boom in the in literacy throughout the world, but especially in Europe and North America, um, that took place in the uh, in the twentieth century is unprecedented in history. Um, and and so, but what were the influence the inf, who were the influencers on this education? Uh, and it was that education was by and large imbued with Christian principles until uh, the encroachment of new ways of thinking. And some of these, many of these new ways of thinking bracketed God. Uh, and we're living to see the consequences of that. So Father's point is, I think, is a very well taken. Um, back to the three paths. So the three paths are um, awareness. Renewal and dialogue. Okay, um, so awareness would be more like uh, another word. Maybe is like consciousness, right? Correct. Consciousness yeah. of 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 revelation of who God is, doctrine, who I am. Um, a, a renewal would be like personal conversion uh, and dialogue. That maybe that's a maybe that's a synonym for mission. Would that be correct? To, yeah, to... that's correct. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, a, a one comment about awareness or consciousness in in Italian, there's only one word that you have to know by context whether to translate as conscience, moral conscience, okay. or let's call it uh, introspective consciousness, awareness that uh, of who I am. Uh, and so that's the word that Paul VI used. And just as a quick aside, um, the uh, when John Paul II hit the scene and the scholars uh, got all excited about uh, a, you know some fresh language and concepts, uh, and they went to work and discovered that John Paul II was a phenomenologist. So they assumed that the idea of consciousness came from his phenomenology. Big mistake that that the idea that his understanding of consciousness uh, that he took it to another level and that he borrowed from his uh, phenomenology to deepen that idea yes uh, but but his his he was inspired by Paul the sixth after all he took the double name John Paul John the twenty third and Paul the sixth that's kind of a not so subtle way of saying I'm going to commit my pontificate to implementing Vatican II mm -hmm. in fidelity to my predecessors. And so it's right there in his very first encyclical where he uh, he basically says, I'm taking Vatican II and therefore I'm taking Ecclesium Suum to guide my pontificate. And so if you want to understand John Paul II, and there's lots of people with devotion to John Paul II, um, you really need to study Vatican II, but you need to do so in light of Ecclesiam Suum, Paul VI encyclical, because this is the, the intellectual framework for John Paul's understanding of his entire pontificate, as well as the renewal of the, the Jubilee year 2000, 
and the new evangelization. So back to your point, um, mission. Dialogue is dialogue is the mode of mission in the life of the church. Okay. And um, what do you mean by that exactly? It, it's the modality, it's the way that we conduct mission. Okay. And the reason for that is, as Paul the Six uh, points out and develops, because properly understood, God revealed in a dialogical mode or manner. And so God's working with us is the model for the way that the church should interact with the world. That seems to make a lot of sense. Of course, God fully reveals himself in Jesus Christ. And so if you can understand Christ's mission dialogically, well, the church is commissioned to continue his mission. And so therefore, she should imitate the master and act dialogically. Unfortunately, the word was co-opted by people who didn't really understand it. And, and there are many Catholics. In fact, I just gave a talk in a parish um, uh, this Monday evening, and the idea of dialogue came up, and it was clear that for some people, that's not a good word. They've had a really bad experience of dialogue as compromise in terms of doctrine. Sure, so sure. We, have to, we have to know what we're talking about. So, so the implication with dialogue, so first of all, there's a model here, right? The, the, the divine pedagogy. Um, Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I send you, okay, to his, to his apostles, to the church, okay? And how was he sent? He was sent as the Word, the Word incarnate. And so um, he entered into dialogue with humanity. Um, and so we're to follow that path. And so it's a dialogue as opposed to maybe when I think of, when I think of the errors of dialogue, I think on the one hand, one end of the spectrum, there's the error of um, relativism. Okay. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's uh, maybe imposition. Okay. Um, can, can you, um, can you speak to that a little bit that the, 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 you know, this is a summit in between the two. I don't know if that's the right way, but can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I, I, it might be helpful to kind of, uh, for me to give you a thumbnail summary of the, I'll call it the old apologetics. Okay. Uh, the old apologetics, which was born out of Christendom, uh, a fundamentally Christian society or culture, basically uh, put all of the emphasis on what theologians would call the formal object of faith. God as first truth and unquestioned authority. And so it's very logical. Uh, well, then we have to prove that God exists. So that's the first thing you do. Then you prove that it's, got, it's capable, it's possible that God might reveal. Then you prove that he did reveal. Then you prove that this revelation comes to its fullness in Jesus Christ. Then you prove that Christ established one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And anyone who's followed all those arguments is going to say, I want in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the new apologetics of Vatican II is an apologetics of meaning and an apologetics of explanation. Okay. And so, it's, so uh, back to your family analogy, how sweet is life when all of your parents perfect, or your children perfectly follow the fourth commandment? <laughs> yeah. All you got to do is start off every sentence with, I am your father. And, and there's an ergo, you must believe and obey and conform. Uh -huh. That's for children. So somewhere between being seven years old and being 27 years old, there should be a catechesis that is not defensive and based only on arguments of authority, but that takes what theologians call the material object of faith, the content of faith, and explains how your life will be richer if you believe this. Mm -hmm. so, so this is important for understanding Vatican II. Hey, Father, we'll get back to our regularly scheduled conversation shortly. There's something exciting, though, that I need to share with you. The Evangelical Catholic and the Catholic Leadership Institute are hosting a conference specifically for priests like you. 
The Priests for an Apostolic Age Conference supports mission-minded priests in their quest to bring the gospel to the modern world. This conference will equip you with apostolic vision and tools, and it has a great lineup of speakers, discussions, workshops, and communal worship. Be refreshed by four days of learning, inspiration, and collaboration. Join us January 21st through the 24th in 2025 in San Antonio, Texas for four days of content, worship, fellowship designed uniquely for you in your priestly vocation. Now, back to the podcast. Uh, There are three questions we can ask about our faith. What has a claim on my faith? In other words, what has God revealed? But notice that presupposes that I believe in God and I accept his authority. So uh, with that presupposition, questions we can ask are, what has a claim on my faith? How should it properly be understood? Well, that's what all the other councils throughout the church's history, they answered those two questions. Here is our faith. So you've got the creeds of Nicaea uh, and, and, um, and the early creeds. Um, and here's what has a claim on our faith. And then when, uh, when councils were called to correct uh, errors called heresies, here's how you should understand these words, these propositions of faith. Vatican II wanted to answer a third question. What difference will believing make in your life? In other words, it was, it was more, why should you believe in the first place? Because that foundation of faith had so eroded that even those people who knew their faith really weren't living, or many of them weren't living it. And so I call this an apologetic... Professor Bush, Yes. I was going to say that when you describe the old apologetics, is there something of an enlightenment error at work there where it's purely intellectual assent, where it's pure rational exercise? Thank you. Absolutely there is. Uh, and, and, and this kind of works in the age of Christendom, by the way. So it's not just, uh, you can see where this comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when every, when every aunt and uncle and cousin and, and all your neighbors are Catholic and go to church on Sunday and, and, are, uh, and it imbues the culture, um, uh, then you don't have to, then, then the foundation is reinforced over and over again in practically every way. But the problem with that is then you might not examine that foundation and then you can't defend yourself against it when all of a sudden enlightenment and the collapse of Christian culture takes place. So Vatican II, Vatican II has been called by uh, theologians as the Council of Fundamental Theology, going back to the, the very roots of faith itself, wow. uh, which which, uh, which had eroded. Uh, this is this is really what our popes have meant when they talk about having a personal encounter with Jesus Christ and a personal relationship with Him. And and what I find so compelling about Vatican II, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and this goes to your question. Uh, when you when you look at Scripture, um, God revealed Himself. Let's take the the great old covenant uh, of Mount Sinai and Moses. God revealed Himself by acting in behalf on behalf in behalf of His people by serving them by setting them free from slavery in Egypt. The first thing they know about this God is He cares about them, He loves them, and He's powerful enough to enact his love to make a real difference in their lives. Uh, This is where I think the miracles of healing in Jesus's life are so important. His love, he's powerful. His love is efficacious. He changes the human condition. But we know that the the miracles of healing are at the service of another mission that's, uh, that's more central, and that is the forgiveness of sins. And so, uh, so to know, we have to know Jesus, not just as a great teacher and not as a miracle worker and not, he is both of those, by the way, and he's a holy man to imitate, but he's your savior. And in order to know him as your savior, you have to know yourself as needing to be saved. Mm. And, and, and that means you have to know what sin is. And that means you have to have an objective morality. You see where this is going in our culture. Uh, you have to have a sense of sin. 
And what is it that so many preachers today have a hard time talking about uh, as if they're afraid of the subject? And, and, and by the way, as if people don't know deep down that there's a reality called sin in their lives. Can I just say one before, I, I don't want to go on too long on this point, but um, uh, the scriptures uh, tell us that uh, John the Baptist was preaching along the, the Jordan. And they say everyone from Jerusalem and from all over Judea, they went out to see him. And what was, what, what was his gentle pastoral style? <laughs> Brood of vipers, you know, <laughs> who, who, who warned you to flee the coming rep retribution? A call to repentance. Now, why would everyone from Jerusalem and from all over Judea go out to hear what today we would say, oh, people don't want to hear that. we got preachers who are so confused about this and they avoid the subject because they're afraid of, of turning people away. We need a new liturgy of the, we need a new uh, ministry of the word, which has the boldness to reveal people to themselves. Uh, and, to, and, but don't leave them there. You give them hope. John the Baptist gave them a baptism of repentance, pointing towards Jesus, who's the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. I see all of this in, in, the, in the Second Vatican Council. Yeah. You know, the, it's the new apologetics has a so what factor in it, right? So, like, so what? What's in it for me? I, I, I feel like the Second Vatican Council, so dialogue assumes that my life has been changed and that I'm trying to live this life, um, this life of love, this life of joy, and it's making a difference in my life. And I'm living it in such a way that, that turns heads. And, and I, I, I feel like there, um, dialogue, at least today, you know, I, I remember, um, you used to say this and this has stuck with me since grad school, the battle for the battle for souls is waged over the correct definition of happiness. Okay. Right. Everyone is seeking happiness. You can't not want it, but we seek for it in all sorts of different ways. And people are looking for an example, an exemplar of happiness, of living the good life. And, um, if, if I'm just talking, okay, and I'm not living that life, first of all, I can't speak from an area of, uh, from a place of co-naturality and, and people are really keen at picking up, picking out, um, uh, hypocrisy, uh, or a lack of authenticity. And if people pick up on a lack of authenticity, they're going to, they're going to, I'm going to be a hypocrite. I'm going to actually be a counter witness. Um, but if, but if I'm living this life, so this is, I'm, I'm hinting at the, the first two paths, right? Awareness and then, and then renewal. If I'm living a life of renewal, this is now going to equip me to be able to speak, to introduce people to my best friends, so to speak. Um, and, and if anyone listens to teachers, it's because they're witnesses, right? Um, so uh, that's, that's where kind of, kind of coming full circle, like the, so what factor, the what's in it for me factor. People don't want to just hear what a bunch of old gray-haired men in Rome are trying to teach us. Um, people today don't have time for that. They want to see Jesus. That was just one of the readings a few days ago. Um, was it, it was Herod. He was, he was, it was, it was one of the gospels a few days ago. He, he was trying to see Jesus or he wanted to see Jesus. Everyone wants to see Jesus and we have to show him Jesus by our changed lives. And that, that requires um, self-knowledge, humility, conversion. Exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, and I want to come back to that, but I, but, uh, we, I don't think we finished a, an important point that Father brought up. Oh, yeah. And, and that is, uh, there is, there's an interesting kind of suffering called intellectual suffering. Uh, and there are people who are blessed with intellectual gifts and they read a lot of history and, and maybe philosophy and they, and they love, they, they're really, they are truth seekers. The church has to be prepared to evangelize them also, you see. Uh, I, I, I think the vast majority of people in North America, despite our robust education system, are not there. 
Okay, but but there's we we always need in the church people who can answer questions, define terms, uh, sh- uh, refute arguments, and things like this. Mm-hmm. Jesus, I mean, uh, his longest dialogue with any individual in the Gospels is with the Samaritan woman. Hmm. There's there's no miracle. This is this is serious intellectual dialogue going on here, uh, and uh, of course, part of it is. Uh, to bring her to a point of conversion, recognizing her sins. But but uh, are you greater than Jacob who gave us this well? And uh, I've heard about a Messiah. And um, uh, so we, as, as sick as our culture is right now, I think intellectually, there are people who are on the cusp of kind of breaking through that. They're unsatisfied. And we've got to be prepared to have really great intellectual conversations with them. In other words, truth is the good of the intellect. People will suffer without that. And it is a it is a spiritual work of mercy to set them free with the truth. Okay. Most people uh, need to be reached in another way, though. They are so damaged. Today, we use the word wounded by not having encountered love in their family or or wherever uh, that they just need to be loved and so they they're 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 spiritually like lepers or blind people and just so today we talk about the ministry of presence the ministry of listening and while in my i've read some things that i think are terribly trivial about that the general idea is right on target what i mean Think of Mother Teresa of St. Teresa of Calcutta. Um, everybody else walked by this poorest of the poor and she stopped. What was what was her message? Her message is, um, I'm not going to let you die wondering if you're lovable. Mm. I, I refuse to let you, I, in the name of Jesus Christ, I am here to tell you that there is a goodness in you, a dignity, and I'm affirming that. And it might be the last few minutes or few hours of the person's life, but that's how I interpret the you know, corporal works of mercy and her mission in particular. And so back to the scriptures, the, the Hebrew slaves, um, God would explain to him, them who he was later, but he had to get their attention first. And so St. Thomas Aquinas in innumerable times quotes 1 John chapter 4, God loved us first and our love is a response. Now you're going to get really interested in knowing someone if you love them, but you won't love the person unless you're loved by that person. And so the great St. Thomas Aquinas uh, sees in that beautiful passage uh, verse in First John chapter four a real key to understanding what faith is. That's why Benedict the Sixteenth said, I, "I've got two pages of quotations on this. What is faith? Faith is the certainty of having been loved by God in Jesus Christ." Now, if you've got that, the creed makes all kinds of sense. But without it, what sense would the creed make? You see, and so this is his, he, he, he sees how the collapse of the Christian culture has resulted in us having to go back to what was taken for granted, a, a, a kind of cultural presupposition that you cannot presuppose today. Does that make sense? Yes. So what's sticking with me right now is faith is the certitude that you are loved by God. Am I saying Correct. that right? Yep. Wow. In that's... Christ. Yeah. Christian faith in Christ. Yeah. And that, and that's well, certainly why... you're speaking professor that the experience of human love is a prerequisite to believing that God is love and that now God is loving me. Amen. So two things about that. Uh, first of all, God works through human agents. So, uh, I mean, God set the slaves free from slavery in, in Egypt, but he did it through Moses. And so, so, so who, who, do the, who do the Jews revere? Uh, it's, well, it's Moses, but it's also God. It, it, by the way, there's this great, uh, it's, um, 
Exodus chapter uh, 14, verse 31. It comes right before the great song of praising God for liberation uh, through the parting of the sea. And, and it says, uh, Israel looked back and saw uh, the soldiers of Pharaoh uh, drowned in the sea. And Israel placed its faith in God and in Moses, his servant. It's my favorite passage to work with uh, in, in dialogue with uh, uh, you know, Protestant uh, theologians and people because uh, it's in the Bible. But that does not work in Protestantism. You can only have faith in God. You, you don't have faith in human mediators, right? <laughs> and, you know, what's more natural than to, to place your faith in a, in a properly understood way in the person that God's working through? And so, yes, so people who are unloved need to be loved by God, but they're going to be loved by persons who do so in the name of God, in the name of Jesus Christ. So that, and, and one more point. That, that for I sure. Think, yeah. Now you can see how family life and the fourth commandment are, are really the foundation for all covenantal theology. Uh, children don't ask to be born. Uh, it's a totally gratuitous act on the part of the love of the parents. And then parents pour themselves out in loving their children and some huge percentage of that love, uh, it's all biological, it's all physical uh, for the first you know, months. Uh, but even already there, certain psychic relationships are starting to develop, tenderness with mom who might be nursing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so if parents pour themselves out in loving their children, then they have a pretty powerful argument to make when the children uh, reach the age of reason and beyond. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and so what I said to my children was, if I were you, I wouldn't make any decision in life without consulting your mother. No one knows you better than she does, and no one loves you better than she does. And, and, and it wasn't the neighbor lady who risked her life in bringing you into the world. Uh, it was your mother. And so the, the hope was that this would transfer to Mother Church and to Mother Mary. And indeed, uh, we, we were blessed to see our children uh, because they were loved. Um, uh, her, uh, Their mother especially, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of like alongside her in this, but because they were so well loved, they knew that we would never use our authority for our own purposes, uh, but to serve them. And, um, and so we had a very strong argument to make. That's so good. Um, it r makes me think of th this whole, you know, the last five minutes makes me think of an another thing that I remember from grad school. And I think in one of your recent books, you wrote this as well, that whenever God is loving us, he, al he also always has someone else in mind. Um, how, how can someone know that God loves them unless they're first loved by someone else? Um, who can reveal that love to them as as an instrument, right? As as a, as an instrumental cause, right? Um, because we reason back, right? In, in in this life, we we understand the causes of things through their effects. We see, you know, um, you know, we we see the effects of things. We reason back. Oh, it must be because of this. Um, so um, I find that so powerful, and especially in 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 light of the theology of renewal, right? The theology of renewal is there's there was a pastoral a pastoral call to a new evangelization, to dialogue. Um, and, and how can we actually enter into dialogue um, unless we first sit and be loved and are renewed in, in, in the conviction that, that we are loved by God? And, and then further, that as he's loving us, he's also thinking of other people for whom he wants to use us as, as instruments. Uh, I just think that's, that it's, it's just a beautiful, um, it's just beautiful. So we're at the heart of, of the book and Paul, the sixth vision for Vatican II. If there's a deficit of witness to Christ, that can only be explained by there's a deficit of conversion into being loved by Christ. Mm -hmm. OK, and so so the fruit of conversion is mission, ministry, apostolate. 
many people do not know that uh, John Paul II and Benedict XVI uh, equated the dialogue of Ecclesiom Suum to new evangelization. So when all the time John Paul was talking about new evangelization, he was talking about this is the fruit of Vatican II. In other words, it's the fruit of personal conversion. I mentioned the, the Samaritan woman. One of the most amazing things in this, for me, in this story, uh, in this account, is that um, the love is self-commissioning. Oh, wow. Yeah, Jesus didn't say, uh, go, go say something to your neighbor. When his disciples came, and he obviously must have turned to them, that was an opportunity for her to go running to all these people that she had avoided uh, by going to the well at the hottest, hottest time of the day because they would know about her awkward uh, uh, you know, marital situation. Love is self-commissioning. So, so this is, if we can get people to come in contact with God's love through the forgiveness of sins, um, if, if we can have a more robust ministry of the word in the church, uh, like that of Benedict XVI, like that of John Paul II, which explains people to themselves like John, like uh, John the Baptist, and gives them hope. Uh, when we can witness to the, you know, why did I have my children baptized? Because this is what I call the logic of sin. Okay, this is very simple. Sin, in uh, properly understood, is a rejection of God's love and a concrete act of disobedience. Wisdom eleven sixteen says that we are punished by that by which we sin. Mm -hmm. If you reject God's love, the just punishment is to live without his love. And that means I wonder if I'm lovable. And that is no way to live. That is what you call absolute metaphysical existential crisis. And that's what I see. I think that's what the popes have seen in our culture, especially in Western Europe and the developed countries in North America. People are, uh, you know, we've got this ec economy that's uh, doing amazing things. We've got technology, et cetera, et cetera. And why are the suicide rates and the drug addiction rates and the violence rates uh, skyrocketing? It's because the thing that we need most is lacking. It's relationships. It's being loved and loving. Uh, the ancient philosophers called it friendship. All right. Mm -hmm. and, and you might remember in your courses, St. Thomas Aquinas, when he came to define Christian charity, it's supernatural friendship. Well, where are lasting friendships today that are rooted in the truth, you see, rooted in virtue? And so, so the, back to Vatican II, uh, we need a new evangelization that is a personal witness to Jesus Christ. Now, oh, by the way, see, there's so much to say here. Uh, 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 Benedict the Sixteenth had a predilection for um, uh, Galatians two twenty, where Saint Paul refers to Jesus as the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. See this for me dimension, and, and it's in our creed, right? But people don't see that uh, for our sake and for our salvation. Okay, um, and then he, he was crucified. For um, uh, I, I can never do my prayer starting in the middle. I got to start at the beginning. But there, twice in the creed, it's for us, for us men, and for our salvation, and for our sake. Um, and uh, and and so I think it, it, that's a personal encounter with Jesus allows you to use Mary's formula. The same thing in the Magnificat. He was mighty; has done great things for me. That's the first thing you should know about God. And, and, and if, if that's your foundation, good catechesis will get you to understand that he's Trinity, uh, that he's infinite, that he, uh, he, all the divine attributes and all of salvation history. Why should you be interested in any of that if he hasn't healed you in some way? That's, my favorite, I, the, that's my favorite Bible yeah. passage, Galatians 2.20. It's, it's been my favorite for years and years. Uh, so anyway, that, I, I didn't know that he had a the, the prelection for that. that so he says there is no true evangelization until the evangelizer is able to say, for me. Wow, that's that's awesome. Father, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say that we're speaking of the three paths in Ecclesiastes Suam. 
and you had spoken how you kind of work backwards from yes. the dialogue mission precedes that renewal precedes that consciousness awareness so as you've been saying if there's a deficit in mission it's because there's a deficit in renewal if there's a deficit in renewal it's because there's a deficit in consciousness which brings us to the kerygma the proclamation that he died for me as in the creed for us and for our salvation so the new evangelization brings us stepwise to that proclamation of the kerygma to our our own experience of that right that that is where it all begins and monsignor shea has this um emphasis on recapturing the christian imagination the christian story the christian narrative that the divine love story that if we lose the sense of the divine love story we have nothing to to go forward from with these three paths thank you in fact i i i, I might want to get a transcript of what you just said and uh have a little epilogue on, in my book. Here's the summary of the book, uh, according to Father O'Hare. <laughs> it's a you said it better than I than I have. Um, but but notice what's happened, uh, both with regard to Vatican II and in I'll say in particular for moral theology. Uh, published and on the lecture circuit, theologians have created. Uh, there's there's like a question mark behind every point of doctrine these days. Uh, and so the, uh, as a theologian, I'm grateful for the doctrine of individual judgment. I would not want to be judged as a member of late 20th century and early third millennium theologians. Uh, <laughs> so, but see, there's, would, would a person die over a doctrine that maybe perhaps was true before and we're not sure anymore? Conversion is a death event. This is this is what baptism is, right? We're plunged into the the death of Christ so that we can rise with Him to new life in the Holy Spirit. Um, but but uh, you're not. People will not die over things that are theologically controverted. The, the damage that the publishing of theology and and now the internet and the blogs and everything else has done precisely to undermine. And, and Vatican II. I mean, there's so many argumentations about Vatican II. Who's going to take the council seriously? So, so now to work things back from the beginning to, to the third, if, if, if you're not rock solid, sure, about the truth that Christ died to reveal, then that truth is not likely to make life-changing demands on you, and there won't be any conversion. And so we have to have the deep conviction about Christ's promises to the church uh, being the bulwark of truth, as St. Paul says to Timothy. Oh, wonderful. Well, this has been, for me, a very uh, stimulating conversation. Um, we're we're butting up against the end of our episode here, but uh, we're going to continue this conversation in another episode. So, um, as as always, let's end with uh, with a couple takeaways. So, Father, do you have a takeaway? from this, from our conversation today? Well, the, uh, the relevance for Ecclesiam Suam and the new evangelization, Peter, you and I have these interesting conversations week after week about the new evangelization, all different angles on it. But to know that there's this document, Ecclesiam Suam from Pope Paul VI encyclical, which provides the sort of the lens through which to look at all those relate all those topics that 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 are pertinent to the new evangelization just makes you want to dig into the document that yes as seminarians we never read <laughs> um my takeaway is this statement right here faith is a conviction that i am loved by god that that's um that's going to sit with me. That's it's it's the it it's uh, it it takes it takes um, the under my understanding of faith to a whole new level. Uh, so that's that's great, Douglas. Um, if you could if you could maybe suggest a takeaway for our priest listeners out there, what would from our conversation today? What would that be? 
That's a really good question. Uh, it, I think it would be to uh, take the time to read Ecclesiom Suam and to be nourished by it um, and to uh, reflect on what they can do in their ministry of the word to prioritize the theme that summarizes all of sacred scripture. So to put it in one verse, 1 John 4.16, we have come to know and to believe in the love that God has for us. Make that the foundation of your entire ministry of the word and, uh, and then discover ways to get that message across to, in, in you know, age appropriate ways, audience appropriate ways, because I don't see how there can be a renewal in the church without a renewal of faith, and that's the foundation. Wonderful, thank you. Read, read so um, guys, read the encyclical and also read um, Douglas Bushman's book, uh, The Theology of Renewal for His Church. And, and maybe as a suggestion, do what I did. I, I took Ecclesium Suum and I used it actually as a bookmark in the book. <laughs> And I, I kind of read them uh, together along the way. So, uh, Douglas, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, we're going to continue this conversation in our next episode. Uh, so let's let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, my God, for the good inspirations, affections, and resolutions that you've communicated to us in this conversation. We ask you for the grace to put them into effect our Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, our guardian angels, pray for us. Pray for in the us. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next time, everyone. <laughs>